You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The Federal Judicial Center and the United States Sentencing Commission present Sentencing and Guidelines, a conversation with Judge Diana Murphy. Now your host, Robin Rowland. Hello, and welcome to A Conversation with Judge Diana Murphy. The purpose of today's broadcast is to introduce you not only to Judge Murphy and the workings of the United States Sentencing Commission, but also to all the commissioners. As you know, last November, a full complement of commissioners was appointed to the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Since then, they've been consumed in a whirlwind of work, from addressing open issues to working through the amendment cycle without stopping to take a breath. Judge Murphy, the chair of the commission, now stops to take that breath and reflect on the current and future work of the commission with Judge Fern Smith, the director of the Federal Judicial Center. In addition to their conversation, we have highlights from the May 2000 9th Annual National Seminar on Federal Sentencing Guidelines, co-sponsored by the Commission and the Federal Bar Association. During that seminar, all nine commissioners appeared on a panel entitled Meet the Commission, moderated by James Spellman, who represented the Federal Bar Association. The commissioners commented on a variety of federal sentencing and sentencing guideline topics. For example, one issue that continues to arise is the crack versus powder cocaine debate. At the seminar, Judge Johnson updated the audience of mostly probation officers and attorneys on this issue. And in 1994, Congress uh, directed the Sentencing Commission to conduct a study and to make uh, recommendations. And in 1994, uh, the Commission said that uh, the 100 to 1 ratio was really uh, unjustified. And uh, they uh, voted in a very, very controversial decision uh, by a 4 to 3 margin that the penalty should be equal. It went to Congress, as all of the Commission's recommendations do, and Congress rejected it. Now, as I said before, even the three who voted against making it uh, equal did say that uh, 100 uh, to 1 really is unjustified. So Congress sent it back, and in uh, April 1997, uh, the Sentencing Commission uh, said that um, we will uh, change the triggering amounts for powdered cocaine from 500 grams to anywhere between 125 grams to 375 grams. So they would lower that. And they would uh, change the five gram uh, triggering mandatory minimum from crack cocaine from anywhere between 25 and 75 grams. That was sent to the Congress in April of 1997, and it sits there to this day. In addition to updates like Judge Johnson's, Commissioners also informed the participants of issues which the Commission might consider in future amendment cycles. Judge Kendall commented on whether alternatives to incarceration should be expanded under the guidelines. And I think sometimes people miss that in that it is viewed that the only real punishment uh, is incarceration. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, probation is punishment. Home confinement certainly is punishment. Uh, confinement in a community-based facility is punishment. All of those still can, all of those different alternatives, and again, let me just say I'm speaking for myself here. I, I've talked to some of the other commissioners and we've, we've had some discussions about this, so I'm not purporting to speak for us as a group, but uh, I fully expect that this commission will take a look at uh, those issues, issues of alternatives as set forth in the enabling legislation. You'll get a chance to meet all of the commissioners as we periodically return to the panel discussion throughout the broadcast. And now let's turn to Judge Murphy and Judge Smith. 
Judge Diana Murphy was appointed chair of the United States Sentencing Commission, along with the rest of the commissioners in November 1999. Judge Murphy currently serves on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, where she's been since 1994. She was appointed to the U.S. District Court for the District of Minnesota in 1980 and served as its chief judge from 1992 to 1994. Judge Murphy also served as a state district court judge from 1976 to 1980. Talking with Judge Murphy is Judge Fern Smith, the director of the Federal Judicial Center. Judge Smith became the center's director in 1999. She's been a judge for the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of California since her appointment in 1988. Prior to that, Judge Smith was also a state judge from 1986 to 1988. They spoke earlier this summer here in our studio. Judge Murphy, good morning. Good morning, Judge Smith. It's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to converse with you about the Sentencing Commission. Let's start with your role as the chair. What have you been able to accomplish since the commission finally got up to full strength and was able to start working again? Well, I take that really as a question about what the commission has accomplished. Um, and uh, we've had a whirlwind of activity because, uh, as, as you know, we started in the middle of November and the annual cycle ends on May 1. That's the deadline to get amendments and guidelines to Congress. And uh, in that period of time, uh, we uh, promulgated guidelines in a number of areas, the No Electronic Theft Act, uh, sexual predators, some firearms offenses, uh, identity theft, uh, methamphetamine um, sentences, and um, uh, telephone cloning. And uh, those were uh, responding to legislative directives or new legislation. We also resolved a number of circuit conflicts uh, in interpretation of the guidelines. And uh, there are always some technical amendments to do. But uh, just getting the place organized and running, of course, was uh, particularly a responsibility of the chair and so we feel pretty good about what we've been able to do in this cycle. I would think so. Have there been any surprises? Well, yes. Uh, I, I, yes, I've had several surprises. I would say um, uh, two very pleasant ones and one not so pleasant. Um, I really didn't know the other uh, commissioners. There were two that I had met but so I wasn't really sure what kind of group uh, we would have. Obviously, they were very qualified. But um, I, we're really working together very well. They're very uh, knowledgeable about the guidelines. They're smart. They're hardworking. They're always very prepared. And uh, perhaps most important of all, uh, they have the quality of being able to listen to each other and to members of the public or interested groups. And uh, that's enabled us to get this much done. So that would be uh, a very pleasant you know, surprise. It wasn't that I was expecting the other, but you never know. And the, uh, the next thing that uh, I guess I'd mention is that uh, it's been a surprise how well what we've done has been received. And the reason I say that is because there are so many different groups that are affected by the guidelines. Uh, and you might expect uh, naturally that uh, prosecutors and public defenders, probation officers, judges, uh, members of industry groups, uh, Congress, all have some different perspective in the Department of Justice, of course. And uh, to be getting the positive feedback that we have from such a variety of groups uh, who seem to understand the complexity of, of mm -hmm. how we have to meet so many different concerns, that's been a a very gratifying surprise. The, um, the unpleasant surprise was to discover that while there were no commissioners, there weren't any at all for 13 months, and for a time period before that, extending back uh, really a couple of years, there were vacancies that came that uh, on the commission that weren't able to be filled because the uh, appointing forces weren't able to agree. And uh, the budget was cut way back. Uh, because of that, because the view on the Hill was, well, if there aren't commissioners, uh, you don't need as much of a budget. And it wasn't 
unreasonable in, in some respects, but uh, now we're all there and we have a greatly reduced staff, and so uh, we've been working really hard on, on bringing that up to what it was before. Well, I'm sure that's a lot of work. I heard that in late May, you and your fellow commissioners uh, met for a few days on a goal-setting retreat. Tell me about that. What kinds of things did you discuss, and what kind of results were you hoping for? Well, um, that was the first time that we ever were able to sort of relax because of the fact that we had this very short cycle to do our work for this uh, uh, year. And um, so here was an opportunity for us to uh, sit back, reflect on how we felt about what we had done during the year, um, uh, substantively, but also how we had done it, if we were happy with that. And um, I think that took less time than I thought it might when we were setting up the retreat and the agenda for it, because pretty much people were content on both scores. Then we also, uh, we had learned something about the history of past commissions during our confirmation process and, the, and preparation for it. And uh, we want to learn from the strengths and uh, problems also mm -hmm. that occurred in the past. And so we, we took a little time reflecting on, on what we could about the history and to build on, on uh, what has really worked well and also to look out for some of the, the um, uh, pitfalls that uh, popped up. And then finally, uh, and very importantly, we wanted to think about what we wanted to do uh, in the short-term future and in, in the long-term. The terms are staggered, so we have different terms, but we're all going to be there for a limited, finite period of time. And uh, we want to do as much as we can to make these guidelines effective, workable, to be able to advise Congress on sentencing policy. Um, and so we worked out an agenda for this coming year, uh, a tentative agenda. Mm -hmm. We published it already in the Federal Register. We'll be getting feedback, and we might alter it somewhat depending upon the feedback. But we also talked about our longer range, uh, some longer range plans. Are there any of those future plans that you would like to discuss with us today? Well, uh, yes, I, um, just for this year, of course, uh, we have published the notice as I indicated, mm -hmm. and uh, we're hoping to work on economic crimes. Um, the commission in the past has had some unfinished work in, uh, in theft, fraud, uh, tax, money laundering, where there have been some problems. We're going to have an economic crime symposium. And what we have conceived of, and the, uh, Commissioner O'Neill is assisting me in co-chairing uh, uh, an effort to put together a third symposium for the commission this fall focusing on economic crimes. We've uh, scheduled it for, I think it's October 12 and 13. It's the Thursday and Friday of uh, the week uh, following Columbus Day. Uh, and it will be held at uh, George Mason University Law School in uh, Arlington, Virginia. We're thinking of an invited audience uh, of uh, about 175 to 200 persons, and that audience will be multifaceted, uh, uh, consisting of uh, the federal legal community representatives, judges, probation officers, attorneys, um, also some representatives of academia, and uh, perhaps of the business community. And our focus, uh, while it's called an economic crime symposium, we're, we're thinking of within that broader umbrella of including a focus on um, a number of issues. As you, many of you have heard from our, uh, what has been said about the amendments recently submitted to Congress, uh, a number of them are related to uh, new ways of committing old crimes uh, and in s some cases uh, new crimes, but all involving some aspect of technological development. No doubt there's going to be continuing interest um, in this area by Congress and, and others. Uh, there's a great deal that uh, we need to learn and to, we have some information that we can share and so we hope to uh, spend part of our symposium conference uh, uh, focusing on those particular issues. The Department of Justice is going to, is interested in working with us on some of these 
uh, areas that have been uh, tough in the past and trying to make them all work together. And uh, right now there are 38 circuit conflicts that we've identified mm. and the Supreme Court gave us the task of uh, uh, dealing with the circuit conflicts and we're in the process of developing some standards that we could use to decide which ones should we do. The Criminal Law Committee gives us some uh, input on that of the uh, Criminal Law Committee of the Judicial Conference, but um, they've said they have 18 priorities. Well, that's still quite a large group, so yes. we're working on these standards. Um, those were, uh, you know, some of the things that we'd be doing this year. We also have to some unfinished work in the sexual mm -hmm. predators and firearms. I'd be very interested in knowing how the Commission, with all of these issues, this huge number of issues, how do you go about deciding which issues you're going to tackle and which specific guidelines you think need amending? Well, um, we have uh, the benefit of a lot of input. Um, one of the ex officio commissioners is a, the Attorney General or her delegate, and uh, uh, we have a very able law professor on leave at the Department of, of Justice, Larry Kirkpatrick. I think the department does strongly support the institutional role of the commission. It would be very easy for the department, when it's passing a crime bill, to simply have as part of the bill a direction from Congress. Uh, you will jump the sentencing guidelines seven levels for this particular enhancement and five levels for that, but it would totally undermine the role of the commission if all they were doing is responding to directives to increase something several, seven levels. That would not allow the commission a chance to deliberate and to calibrate the punishment. So we're willing to take our arguments to the commission and let them perform their deliberative role of, of establishing proportionality in the sentencing system. So we support that role strongly. Uh, so we have a way that we get the views of the Department of Justice. We have some advisory groups of, of uh, criminal defense lawyers, uh, probation, officers, uh, federal defenders, uh, industry groups uh, let us know what they're concerned about. They also let people on the Hill know and we, we hear from the Hill mm -hmm. about uh, uh, things that Congress is interested in us doing. Uh, right on the Commission, of course, we've got quite a bit of expertise. Five of us have uh, sentenced people with the guidelines. Uh, one has been with the Commission since 1989. He was general counsel for many years. Uh, and the seventh commissioner uh, had significant experience on the Hill working uh, with the guideline process and is now a professor of, of criminal law and does some criminal defense work. So uh, and we're just within our own group, we have some ideas. The Criminal Law Committee of the conference suggests what they're interested in and they speak on behalf of the federal judicial uh, branch, um, you know, the staff comes up with ideas mm -hmm. too. We have a very talented staff and uh, so there's really no shortage of ideas. It's just setting the priorities that realistically can be dealt with. Um, I, I'm sure this doesn't come as a surprise to you, uh, but the federal sentencing guidelines are not universally popular and they have been criticized in the past over certain sentencing guidelines, especially where some drug offenses are involved and more particularly where mandatory minimum sentences are involved. Are these issues that the Commission intends to address in the near future? Well, um, as you know, uh, Congress has had quite a bit of interest in mandatory minimums. The Commission's position always has been is that they are inconsistent with the guideline system set up by the Sentencing Reform Act. And uh, we're hoping that to the extent we're able to give prompt and appropriate attention to congressional concerns that no further use will be made of mandatory minimums. Uh, there seems to be now some new interest on the Hill in revisiting the topic to see how well mandatory minimums have worked. Uh, we appeared um, just about two weeks ago at a, a House subcommittee hearing on mandatory minimums and went back over the studies that the Commission has done in the past and the Commission's reasoning about the limitations of mandatory mm -hmm. minimums and uh, the committee seemed very interested in uh, 
in our, our viewpoint. Uh, we also understand that the Criminal Law Committee would like us to uh, update uh, the report that was done about nine years ago on mandatory minimums by the uh, Commission. And to the extent we're able to build up our budget, because we need that for uh, the staff to do all of these things, uh, that's something that we may well undertake. That's kind of a, an interesting relationship between the uh, Commission and Congress, and it's one that has caused certain conflicts to arise. Uh, the Commission is responsible for the sentencing guidelines, and Congress enacts the mandatory minimums, which is uh, something, as you mentioned, that the Commission has often opposed. Uh, do these occasional conflicts with Congress interfere with your ability to follow your original mandate in being the expert sentencing body of the system? Well, you know, we start out uh, behind the eight ball a little bit on this because of the fact that there wasn't a, a commission for quite a bit of time. Things built up. Mm -hmm. There was some frustration on the Hill. And uh, we recognize that Congress is supreme in this area. The commission is a creature of the Congress. We operate on the basis of delegated authority by Congress. The decisions that we make, even the decisions that we make in which we feel we're absolutely correct in, are still ultimately subject to congressional review. And that's as it should be. Because they stand for election, we certainly don't. They're ultimately subject to the people in a way in which we, particularly five of us who sit in the commission, do not. So it's entirely appropriate, I think, for Congress to play the role that it does. But um, a very high-placed uh, person in the Senate uh, just said to me a couple of weeks ago that if we continue to be able to present things to Congress with a 7 to 0 vote, that Congress is going to respect our expertise. And I want to assure anybody who's listening to this that our 7 to 0 vote was not a rubber stamp at all. Uh, on some of the areas that we worked in, we had wide differences among the commissioners. Uh, and we worked through various options, trying to deal with all the different uh, interests and uh, problems that the particular guideline area involved. And uh, so it was only by a lot of hard work and listening to each other and attending to all the different viewpoints that we were able to come up with these. But it does make a difference, uh, Congress is telling mm -hmm. us. And uh, we've also seen that when we go over, because we've made a lot of calls on the Hill, when we go over, uh, we have a great amount of data about the way sentencing has worked. and. Um, they're very interested when we are able to pull it together and show it to them in a way that uh, they don't have much time to be looking at these things. If we can come up with a, something that will they can look at quickly and see the mm -hmm. trend or what the problems are, uh, that's very effective. And, and that's another reason that we're working on our budget, because we need more uh, research uh, help and so on that we can, and to the extent that we can make some studies, like uh, one thing we may be able to um, expand the safety valve. There's, I met with uh, the Attorney General, uh, uh, Janet Reno, recently, and I've talked with the uh, head of the Bureau of Prisons, Kathleen Hawk Sawyer, <clears throat> about this. And uh, the Attorney General said, well, you know, you sh if you could do a study on recidivism rates for the people who mm -hmm. have already been sentenced under the safety valve, and the idea people have that are experienced is that the recidivism is low. So and if that's correct, these people didn't need huge, long sentences to deter them. And um, so that's just one of the areas that we'd be able mm -hmm. to work on. Well, that's encouraging and interesting to hear examples of all three branches of the government working together in areas of common interest. Let's go back to you, um, if, we, if we may. You have uh, an interesting perspective in that you have been a district judge both before and after the sentencing guidelines came into effect. You are now a Court of Appeals judge, and you are also the chair of the Sentencing Commission, three very different and unique positions. 
What is your perspective from all of these different experiences that you've had about the federal sentencing guidelines? Well, um, you know, having been a judge at the time they came in, um, I, I think it's fair to say most of were, us uh, were, at, at the very least, somewhat skeptical of them. Um, but, you know, they provide an objective standard uh, by which uh, a judge can <coughs> sentence in a way that you, you build up some confidence level uh, in being able to use those. and. Um, and I think I also learned as a district judge that uh, the, you have a lot of fact-finding power uh, that you can use to enable you to get the right sentence for an individual person. I, let's face it, the district judges are the ones who are really using these guidelines, mm -hmm. applying them to human beings in all kinds of situations. Um, and uh, I think uh, this, Supreme Court's decision in the United States versus Kuhn has, uh, has helped uh, allow the flexibility um, that judges needed. And I think that it influenced the courts of appeal. Uh, and I think just seeing it from the appellate perspective, you don't know all the details about the case the way the district judge does. However, you, you need to make sure that the guidelines are being applied consistently in your circuit. Uh, and uh, consistent with the, the guidelines themselves, and uh, you would be concerned if there were disparities and so on. And then you get to being here where they're actually made, and that's such a different process than judges go through with the kind of interaction you have with the public and with industry groups, and, and uh, where you have to publish every intent that you have, mm -hmm. and, then, and then another time and another time, and. Uh, um, and you see how difficult it is because it's easy to think, um, well, what we want is flexibility, but at the same time, serious uh, crimes de deserve serious sentences. To go back to the Sentencing Reform Act, and um, and you don't want the disparity. And these are, you know, working in particular things like some of the t things we did this year. You could start out and have a general guideline. Because I came thinking, well, let's simplify the guidelines. It's not as easy as I thought it was going to be because um, if Congress has placed a number of different problems in one statute, like the No Electronic Th mm -hmm. Theft Act, if you had one guideline for it all, it would work very unfairly. And you have to use different principles because if you just have uh, one catch all thing and then an upward or downward departure, uh, you're going to get very wide disparities. So balancing it's very fine-tuned. I know that you're traveling all around the mm -hmm. country all the time visiting uh, circuit conferences and workshops and uh, what do you hear uh, the current view of judges uh, about the guidelines? Uh, do you just see that split between the uh, the new ones and the and the past or is there something that it's not completely split. Um, you know, there are new judges who come in having heard about um, the sentencing guidelines who may have been state court judges or magistrate judges or simply practicing attorneys in the criminal law field who have opinions. You know, in my new role now as, as a director of the Federal Judicial Center, I see judges coming from every circuit, new judges and more experienced um, judges, and it's interesting from my perspective as, as a district judge to look at it, because when I first came um, on the dis went on the district court, the guidelines were new and quite controversial, but 12 years have passed since then. And so now, out of the 599 district judges serving, 75% uh, of them came on the bench after the guidelines were in place. And of the 159 circuit judges now serving, two-thirds of them came on the bench after. This uh, makes me feel old. <laughs> I, know, I know the feeling. Um, so a lot has happened since November of 1987, and for the vast majority of judges now sitting, the guidelines are really all they know when it comes to federal sentencing. And so uh, there's, I think, a, a different approach 
to them. And, and so we find in our new judges orientation program, the judges are very aware of the fact that they need to understand the sentencing laws, including the guidelines. And that's one reason we have the commission, members of the commission staff attend all of our orientation programs uh, for semin uh, and seminars for district judges to introduce them to these laws. And we want to be sure we keep working with the commission so that the information we're passing on to these new judges is correct and up to date. The experienced judges, on the other hand, don't articulate the same need or desire, frankly, for more education. But I think, in general, the, the major disagreement with judges about sentencing really doesn't have to do with the guidelines anymore. It really has to do with the mandatory minimums. And the sense that I get from listening to judges around the country is that what judges would really like would be for Congress to stop enacting mandatory minimum laws and to reduce or reverse the ones that are now on the on the books. But, you know, there are different judges with different points of view, and some find something ano anomalous or in, in need of sentencing or changing that another judge is comfortable with. And, you know, I think that the commission's continuing outreach to judges will help um, discuss these and address these issues for judges um, as they, they go along. And you and I have had uh, enough discussions about this off the record uh, for me to know that both of us agree that the sentencing process has dramatically changed since the advent of the guidelines. And you know, whether one agrees with the sentencing guidelines or not, for all district judges, it's made a huge difference in the process of sentencing, in simply the procedures that we have yes. to go through and the way we have to address various issues. But it's also made a big impact on probation officers. What do you hear and, and view as the way the role of the probation officers has changed due to the guidelines? Well, it, it's um, quite dramatic, I think. Um, when I uh, went on the bench, one of the things I noticed was you'd quite a, you'd get quite a difference in approach uh, between individual probation officers because there wasn't a, uh, this kind of objective standard that they were all were applying or the objective tests. And most importantly, uh, the probation officer made a recommendation, a sentencing recommendation, recommendation to the judge that was private to the judge. And uh, I had come from a state court system where they knew, in fact, it was given orally and the lawyers were right there and they could argue with the judge about it. And, and uh, I, it was very surprising to me then to go to the federal system and learn that that, that very key thing that every uh, prosecutor or defense lawyer would like to know was secret and only given to the judge. And uh, that's one of the things about the guideline system that isn't mentioned as much as I think it should be because it was a very salutary thing of um, having a system that all the probation officers are using, uh, applying in the same way, and then the whatever the recommendation is or the, calcul the calculus that they're doing under the guidelines, whether they think there should be an upward departure or downward mm -hmm. departure, it's right in that report. The parties all have access to it. They can, there's systems set up so they can respond. Yes. And, uh, and the court then may have to have a hearing, uh, depending upon uh, uh, what the nature of the, uh, of the issue is. But uh, the probation officer is, another aspect about how important they are is that I think a lot of us just had a tremendous feeling of unease. This, these things look so complicated. Mm -hmm. I mean, how were we going to find the time to master the system and start applying it? Now, after you work with it for a while, it isn't as mysterious as, as it seemed at first. But the probation officers, as you know uh, from your own experience, Vern, they're the ones that are on the front line. Absolutely. They are the ones that are, uh, you know, going forward, uh, bringing in all the different uh, offense characteristics, mm -hmm. the base offense level, and so on. And everybody else is reacting from then on. Sure. 
So uh, they're they're really critical. Well, they are. They are, and it's nice to have them acknowledged and, and their role in the process acknowledged. Your role is to determine the facts as uh, they exist. And I know that it's difficult, and I know that oftentimes you're not going to be given the full report uh, from the prosecution and the defense in regard to the facts. But I think that ultimately is your responsibility. It is not your responsibility necessarily to reflect the facts that have been argued to you by uh, counsel. Your function should be the same as it was prior to 1987 to the extent that you should accurately reflect what the nature of the facts are, uh, though it may be unpopular, uh, though it may mean rejection of plea agreements, um, because I think ultimately that's the responsibility of the judge to take your facts and then determine whether plea agreements are acceptable. So <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, in some ways your role has been consistent over the years, in some ways obviously different by way of interpretation of the guidelines. Well, getting back to <clears throat> judges, district judges for a minute and the way they view the guidelines, the sense I have is that it's not the concept of guidelines uh, that's objected to as much as the lack of discretion that judges are used to and treasure and, and feel as a terribly integral part of their own role. Is there a way of giving the judges more discretion and yet preserving this concept of reducing unwarranted disparity in sentencing, which I think everybody agrees is a worthy goal? Well, you've used one of the magic buzzwords in that because uh, the statute does talk about unwarranted disparity. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was uh, one of the major uh, things behind the passage of the Sentencing Reform Act was the data showed that there was a huge difference and it, it appeared unwarranted disparity. Um, but uh, no situation is completely identical to the other, as you know. And uh, so by using these objective standards in the guidelines, um, you can apply it to the given situation. And if it's uh, appropriate, the judge can depart either upward or downward. And that's an integral part of the guidelines. Sometimes uh, people think that departures are forbidden by the, the guideline system, and they aren't. That's a, it's an integral uh, feature of it. I don't think anyone in the commission here feels just automatically that departures are bad. Departures are part of the human system of sentencing people. And every human being is different. Every situation is different. And when you try and create uniform guidelines that apply throughout the country, from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, to a small town in Mississippi, it's very difficult to think that uh, departures are something to be frowned upon. I think on the part of the Commission, we will study departure rates to determine if any type of fundamental problems exist. If we see something unusual, that might indicate that there is a systematic problem with the guidelines and that uh, there might be a need to visit some area. But barring that, you should know that departures, even nationwide, are not unusual. One of the circuit conflicts that we uh, addressed this year was aberrant behavior. And, and we worked there to um, try to give uh, judges nationally more opportunity to depart, but in appropriate circumstances. So we had to set out the area where, the, mm -hmm. where they would have the discretion to depart. And, um, uh, and some of the other things we did this year, too. You, you have to be working at both of these uh, together. but. Um, all in all, I think the more judges work with the guidelines, the more they learn how they can apply it in a way that they find just. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for judges or others outside of the commission to assist and contribute to the work of the commission? Well, yes. Uh, we're very interested in, in, uh, in judges' viewpoints. and. Um, we do publish everything in the Federal Register. We're required to do that by law, as I told you, but judges aren't in the common practice of reading the Federal Register. And uh, one uh, of the judges, uh, 
friend of mine, uh, Judge Avery Cohn, uh, it brought it to our attention um, that you know this was he, he was upset about one of these circuit conflicts mm -hmm. that he hadn't heard, he hadn't gotten because he wasn't reading the Federal Register. And we are exploring. We do have a website that we post everything on ourselves, and we're going to we're exploring the possibility of of being able to put all of our notices on the on the JNet and. And we want to communicate with all the judges to let them know about mm -hmm. this. But then we've got um, a hotline people can call when they have particular problems. We have uh, an area that uh, people can call, and we have publications or written responses that may assist in some things. We also are very much into wanting to go out and visit. Um, you know, it's it's. Um, Unless we know what the problems people have working with the guidelines, we can't possibly change it. Our, our goal in knowing the problems is not to say, bad judge, you're not supposed to be doing that, but rather maybe this is something we can bring to Congress's uh, attention mm -hmm. and we can, I mean, the border problems yes. uh, is what I particularly have in mind and I'm thinking about that. But we're going out to circuit conferences, uh, maybe not on quite as dramatic a level as you, and workshops. and. We just met with all the judges in Boston when we were up there for a criminal law committee, and uh, they were they were wonderful. They were so frank, and and they uh, they volunteered to be in any kind of pilot project we would like. Uh, they had quite a variety of viewpoints, and uh, we want to do more mm -hmm. of that. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear, and and I hope that people viewing this. Um, will understand that they don't have to wait though for you to go to them that there are websites and other ways of communicating ideas and seeking information from you about about your projects. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Well, um, you know you, you asked about uh, our, our future. Uh, my term as chair is under the statute uh, is six years, uh, designed to uh, keep this out of politics since it's longer than an elective cycle. And, um, you know, that time goes by quickly. Uh, I've told you some of the things that we mm -hmm. want to do. In, not, in 2002, it's going to be the 15th year anniversary of the guidelines, and we are looking to doing a report that we would have come out that year looking at just how they're working. Uh, an evaluation, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we think that could be useful. I've mentioned um, some of these uh, studies that we want to do so that we can look for more ways we can uh, get away from some of these mandatory minimum, uh, you know, tight boxes. Yes. Um, the U.S. Uh, Commission on Civil Rights has done a study on uh, Native American uh, problems, and one part of it is related to criminal law, and they have asked the commission to study uh, the impact of uh, the guidelines on Native Americans. And in the course of this term working on the sexual predators, we discovered that some of the possibilities we were looking at for enhancements would work particularly severely on Native Americans, mm -hmm. because some reservations have all of the what would normally be state crimes prosecuted by the federal government. So. Uh, instead of getting the uh, the standard in South Dakota for assault, for example, you all of a sudden have the federal guidelines coming in, which have a much more severe uh, impact. And so we want to do some mm -hmm. research there and see if we can. There are a lot of areas that we want to work on, and uh, we hope everybody will be understanding that we can't do it overnight. Have some patience with us, um, and. Uh, and we hope I, we get our budget well, so we can do all this. <laughs> I hope that for you too and for us as well. And, and uh, I think what you've accomplished so far and what you have planned in the works is very interesting and impressive and I'll, I'll look forward to uh, watching for it. Uh, let me comment too on how pleased I am at the collaborative efforts of our two agencies. Um, you know, Diana, you and I have been friends for a long time. I met you right after I went on the bench, and so it's really special for me, both personally and, and professionally, to be able to work with you. I feel that way too. In this Bernie. way, and um, 
I, I wanted to mention in particular our sentencing policy institute, which of course is a collaborative effort and in which the FJC takes the lead, but is certainly joined in, uh, in consultation with the Judicial Conference's Criminal Law Committee and the Sentencing Commission and the Bureau of Prisons and the Administrative Office of the Courts. And it's a way of bringing together judges and probation officers and prosecutors and defense lawyers from all over the country to exchange perspectives and discuss different points of view on these important sentencing issues. And I think the results of, of this institute gives a lot of assistance, both to the Sentencing Commission, I hope, and to the Criminal Law Committee. And I guess we're now in our final planning phase for the next mm -hmm. institute, which is going to be in Phoenix, Arizona in September, the 10th to the 13th. And then, of course, we have our broadcasts, like this one, which has been a great deal of fun. And uh, But we've also done some others. We did one earlier this year on restitution and one on departures. and. I guess we have another one planned together uh, for to be aired in November of this year, November 16th, I think. And it's all part of a continuing series and process to help judges and keep them informed and probation officers and others interested in these developments. So I look forward to more conversations with you personally, off the record and on the record. <laughs> And in the meantime, I thank you very much for joining us well, thank today. Thank you for having, me, for our having me. Our pleasure. We hope you found this conversation informative. If you'd like more information about the new commissioners and their initiatives, check out the Sentencing Commission's website at www.ussc.gov. And if you have questions about guideline application, you can always call the Sentencing Commission's helpline at 202-502-4545. If you have any comments or suggestions for future FJTN programs, be sure to fill out and return the program evaluations. Completing the rosters will also help us plan future broadcasts. Both forms can be found on the FJC's DCN site, jnet.fjc.dcn. As Judge Smith noted, our next joint FJTN production will air live on November 16 and will focus on relevant conduct. Look for details in the next FJTN bulletin. We'll leave you now with some final comments from ex officio Commissioner Michael Gaines at the Guidelines Seminar. Thank you for watching. From where I sit, uh, as an ex officio member of the Sentencing Commission, I have an opportunity to observe and what I observe with this group of uh, folks up here is an exceptionally well qualified commission. I'm not necessarily an expert to comment on that and I would certainly not uh, say anything to disparage the uh, former commissions but I think the Murphy Commission is going to be one that you will be quite pleased with. Uh, you've heard them this morning. They're very bright folks. They know what they're doing. They know the guidelines. They use the guidelines. And I think as you've heard from some of their comments, they're truly interested in those of you who use the guidelines. One of the things that I've been most impressed with is their reaching out for input to the public through public meetings, public hearings that the Commission has held, uh, through the uh, Criminal Law Committee, through the Practitioner's Advisory Group, Probation Officers Group. Uh, they have truly reached out for input, and I think that's very important.